Welcome to the Nanovax podcast, a Nanovaccine Institute curated podcast sharing the latest research and advancements in nanovaccines and nanotherapeutics for human and animal health. The Nanovaccine Institute is a consortium of researchers, institutes, national laboratories, and companies founded and coordinated by Iowa State University. We are developing nanovaccines and nanotherapeutics for respiratory infections, neural disorders, antimicrobial resistance, cancer, aging, and animal health. Our vision is that nanovaccines and nanotherapeutics will revolutionize how we prevent and treat disease. Hello, I'm Kathleen Ross. I am Balaji Narsimhan. I'm Mike Ruff. This season, you will hear from experts across a range of disciplines who study respiratory diseases and antimicrobial resistance. The first half of the season will focus on respiratory disease and antimicrobial research within the Nanovaccine Institute. The Nanovaccine Institute is pioneering the development of novel nano-based countermeasures, such as in a universal influenza vaccine. We will also talk about other emergent and impactful diseases that have radically changed how we consider and develop policy around global public health. The second half will focus on the challenges and countermeasures to antimicrobial resistance. Nanovaccine Institute researchers have developed novel nanomedicine therapies to treat chronic disease caused by bacterial pathogens that have developed antimicrobial resistance. Episodes will explore the different corners of these research topics through presentations on the latest findings as well as conversations among the experts. Hello everyone and welcome to this episode. I am Balaji Narsimhan, Director of the Nanovaccine Institute and Anson Marston Distinguished Professor and Vlasta Klima Balloon Faculty Chair in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering at Iowa State University. In this episode, we will be talking about the emergence and evolution of avian influenza. Since 2003, avian influenza viruses, including H5N1, have circulated in 23 countries, primarily affecting wild birds and poultry, resulting in nearly 900 reported human cases, primarily among people who have had close contact with infected birds and animals. Very recently, a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus called HPAI H5N1 has spread to infect more than 50 animal species. As of June 2024, so just a couple of months ago, the virus has not demonstrated any genetic evidence of the ability to easily spread from person to person. But public health officials are closely monitoring this as part of overreaching pandemic preparedness efforts. Here to talk with us about this today is an expert in this field, Dr. Kevin Legge. Dr. Legge is a professor of pathology, vice chair for research, professor of microbiology and immunology, director of the Department of Pathology Research Flow Cytometry Facility, director of the Immunobiology Graduate Program, Interdisciplinary Program in Immunology, and associate director of the Nanovaccine Institute. Kevin's primary faculty appointment is at the University of Iowa, and his lab focuses on dendritic cell immunobiology and pulmonary immunity. He has been studying immunity to influenza virus for 25 years, and so he's an expert in this area, and we're very happy to, uh, to have him here. Kevin um, also has an active project on avian influenza that um, we collaborate with him on, and this project is focused on developing uh, a nanoparticle-based vaccine against avian influenza. And this research is, is currently in progress and supported by the National Institute of Health, uh, specifically the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. So before we dig into the research, um, perhaps the best place to start is an overview of, uh, of avian influenza. So this season, we have heard about livestock management regarding avian influenza, for logistics to mitigate spread and economic dimensions of the disease. But um, let's maybe begin with, uh, with a conversation about the epidemiology of the disease. So Kevin, welcome. And uh, perhaps we could start with uh, maybe you giving a, a brief overview on sort of what's the source um, of avian influenza, particularly H5N1? What's some of the history behind this, uh, this virus? Yeah, great. I'm glad to be here. So I guess let me start with a, an understanding of how we have flu viruses in general and, and how they, they move through the community. We really deal with two things with flu. One is what we call antigenic drift. This is the slow movement of the virus 
through mutations that occur every year. This is why we get vaccinated every year. That's why your immunity to this year's virus may not be protected against next year's virus. And this is small amino acid changes within the virus that escape our, our neutralizing antibody responses. But flu is a, um, a negative sense segmented virus, uh, RNA virus. And so it has eight segments. And if two flu viruses were to infect one cell, uh, new viruses can appear. So segments one, three, and five could come from virus A, and the remaining segments come from virus B to create a brand new virus. We call this antigenic shift. Uh, and around 1997, what we noticed, at least in poultry, uh, as well as some migratory birds, was a brand new flu virus, an H5N1, what we'll call high path avian flu, and we'll talk about what that is in a minute. But really, it acquired one segment from a, a goose virus. Uh, seven of the other segments came from either duck or quail viruses. And we had one of these antigenic shift events creating this brand new avian H5N1 virus. So how is this different from seasonal influenza? Yeah, so seasonal influenza are, are low path strains of even H5N1 behave more like what we think of in a seasonal way, right? So this virus has a, uh, its entry protein is called HA or hemagglutinin. Uh, it binds to sialic acids on, on the surface of cells to inner cells. Uh, for most of the time, what happens is that HA has to be cleaved by enzymes that are found in our respiratory tract. This is why this is a virus that's respiratory tropic. You don't see it say in the intestines, or you don't see it in the kidney, you don't see it outside of really the respiratory tract. High path avian influenza virus has a polybasic amino acid residue that are, has occurred naturally in the HA that allows it to be cleaved by enzymes throughout the body. So you see systemic movement of this virus throughout the body, as opposed to just local immunity or local tropism because of the cleavage only within the respiratory tract. Uh, there's other some other unique aspects of that, um, and so we know that this polybasic amino acid residues allow systemic movement of the virus, but avian viruses in general tend to use a different sialic acid than human viruses do. Uh, and in particular, they like to bind to alpha-2 three-link sialic acid residues, where human viruses like to bind to alpha-2 six-link sialic acid residues. And we know over time there are mutations that can occur in these avian viruses that will become more human adapted, if you will, to bind to the human respiratory tract. Uh, in fact, we have both alpha-2, 3, and 2, 6 linkage sialic acids in our respiratory trees, but the avian binding sialic acids are really lower in the airways. And so it's thought that maybe you need 10 times as much of the avian viruses to actually infect a human than what you would need with a, say, a seasonal human-based influenza virus that likes that sort of tropism. Uh, and then there's another unique aspect of that. At that HA's cleave, we has fusion of the virus with the membrane of the cell to allow infection. And that occurs in different pHs for avian viruses versus human viruses. So there's a really big burden that has to be overcome for an avian virus to really replicate well in humans. Changes in the HA cleavage sites, changes in what it can bind to, and then changes in the pH susceptibility of the virus. So if the virus is, is not going to behave well with the pH, it would be degraded by acids. But if it changes to something more human-like, it would be able to survive that and you could actually get infections. All right, let's talk a little bit about the disease um, in terms of uh, how, it's, uh, how it's manifested. Uh, so what are the symptoms of, uh, of avian influenza and are there any uh, is there any data that's available about um, you know, age distributions and exposures? Yeah, so the symptoms of flu, avian flu or seasonal flu are roughly the same. Um, what we've seen, at least early on, uh, was that there seemed to be a higher incidence of folks that actually got infected having more severe outcomes. Uh, and if you actually look at the data from early cases from, say, 2003 to 2013, there were roughly 868 cases in humans that were associated with about 457 deaths. So about 53% mortality rate, which was very concerning to the community. Now, what we never knew was what the true denominator of that was, right? If there were asymptomatic people that had been infected and didn't have symptoms, didn't end up in the hospital, 
we wouldn't really know what the denominator is. And to put it in context, a, a seasonal influenza infection has a mortality rate of about 2%. Um, and so 53% was concerning. But again, we thought like this was probably not true because the denominator was much, much greater than what we knew. Uh, and so bringing that back down to more noble levels. And what we've seen with recent outbreaks here in human cases have been relatively mild disease, conjunctivitis, uh, those types of diseases. We haven't seen the lethalities uh, that we've seen in these recent cases. AIDS distribution is a little bit tough. Again, from 2003 to 2013, when it was really, really well studied, it was individuals that were being exposed to infected animals. Uh, and in fact, the age distribution of that was young children. Uh, and it turns out those young children were the ones that were actually the ones tending the animals. And so the question was always, were young children more susceptible or was it because they were the ones being exposed to the animals? And I think the recent cases have suggested more that, in fact, it's exposure to those animals as opposed to maybe age distribution. But we still don't know. 53% mortality would be absolutely catastrophic, obviously. So so we let's hope that we never get to, uh, to a virus that... Uh, that, that has that kind of potential. So um, what evidence is there, Kevin, of uh, probable person-to-person -person transmission? Yeah, I'd say the best case that's been out there is something in 2006. So the WHA reported a case of what was probably human-to-human -human transmission uh, in Indonesia. There were eight individuals in one family that became infected. Um, first one was somebody that was exposed to an infected animals. Uh, then six other members of the family got infected. And then one of them, a young child, uh, we believe infected the father. And and based on the serial natures of the infection, as well as the sequencing, it suggests that there was, again, human-to-human -human transmission. But once again, we think that it takes 10 times as much virus really to infect human-to-human -human transmission. And we've really not seen that occur since. Um, these individuals, it was reported that they seem to have higher viral loads than other individuals in the throats and the nasal passages, uh, which may have resulted in this. Uh, but again, since 2006, there's not been real good evidence for human to human transmission. So given what we saw, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic and how quickly uh, viruses like, like, like these have the potential to have global impact, what is your perspective on sort of the global significance of, uh, of an avian influenza type virus? Well, I think there's both an economic, but also a personal, um, you know, health impact as well. So just to put some economics in, in, into context, in 2022, we had a, a really strong avian influenza outbreak here in the United States uh, that resulted in something like 40 million animals that were lost uh, to the outbreak and an economic burden rating between around 2.5 to $3 billion. Um, so obviously that has impacts on food safety, right? Uh, and, and downstream eco economic effects. As far as human disease right now, the cases have been extremely mild. Um, obviously we know that there needs to be some sort of mutations in this virus to allow widespread human to human transmission. That will probably come with some dampening down typically of symptoms and lethalities. That's what we've seen in the past. Um, and right now those cases have been really mild here in recent times. So obviously spreading of a brand new virus in a immunologically naive population or population that doesn't have immunity to that could be devastating. Uh, but right now all evidence suggests that we have some limited immunity to the virus as well as we have countermeasures that will be able to fight back against it. So you mentioned 40 million birds. Um, I, I suspect that um, that would also have a significant, uh, maybe downstream supply chain impact on seasonal influenza vaccines, many of which are, are egg-based, right? So um, if we had a, an outbreak like this, um, would, would, that would also presumably have an impact on our seasonal influenza uh, vaccine uh, supply, right? It, it very well could for those egg-based produced vaccines. Obviously, we have cell culture-based vaccine production as well now and other technologies that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, but certainly, um, we grow our virus, our vaccine viruses right now that make the vaccine uh, in embryonated chicken eggs. And so if you lose those eggs, then uh, they would have a problem. And in fact, that was one of the original issues in making a high-path avian influenza vaccine, which we do have and have stockpiled. Um, was that polybasic amino acid residue 
that causes systemic release was killing those eggs. And so if you kill the eggs, you can't make the virus that you need for the vaccine. Uh, and so they've been able to remove that to create this uh, stockpile vaccine, which has been shown to be pretty effective uh, with antibodies reacting against the currently circulating strains. Right. So um, what are what are the currently available prevention strategies? What What can people be assured of with respect to what's out there? Are there vaccines? Are there other strategies uh, that are in place to, to, to help us deal with this? Yeah, I think, yes, we have currently stockpiled vaccines that we know, and, and they were tested in the early 2000s against H5N1 and high path avian influenza. Um, and looking at those stockpiled vaccines, uh, and, and individuals that got those vaccines during the trial, they've recently revisited those individuals and looked and they have antibodies that would cross protect it against the currently circulating strain. So we have vaccines ready to go. Um, the other really good thing is that we have antiviral drugs against influenza. And really there are three types of antiviral drugs that we think of with flu. Um, the ones that inhibit the neuraminidase or release of the virus from one cell to another. We have one that interferes with this really interesting if you will, cap snatching ability that the virus use where it takes our own mRNA and uses it for its own good. Um, and then the third is this ion channel blockers. Uh, and two of those three we know still work against the avian influenza. So the, the neuraminidase blockers, things you may have heard of like oseltamivir or Tamiflu, um, the uh, RNA cap snatching, uh, which is Oxfluza, uh, is also very effective as well uh, against this virus. So. We have antivirals ready to go. We have vaccines that have been stockpiled and ready to go. And of course, there are a lot of folks now trying to get better vaccines uh, ready to go in case we need them. What about animal control? Yeah, so animal control is another way. Uh, it has been a, a way of trying to call uh, and to stop the spread. Uh, certainly we've seen that around the world early on in these, in these outbreaks, um, you know, where they would call off poultry, uh, they would call off whatever wild birds, whatever they could needed to do to try to stop the spread. Um, that is, of course, an economic burden, but also a food issue burden as well. Um, and in fact, here in the U.S., something like since 2016, we've there have been about 100 million uh, birds that have been called that have been infected to try to stop the spread. Um, and in fact, you know, we've seen this around the world. We've seen this in, in Vietnam. We've seen this in Thailand. Uh, and in fact, um, the first evidence of, of this virus ever infecting cats, actually because of uh, they were fed infected poultry accidentally, uh, and some tigers at the zoo in Thailand actually came down with the virus. Um, and so all this virus initially started out in migratory birds and you know uh, poultry, if you will. It's gone silent in migratory birds, but it's still circulating in migratory birds. And around the world, as it spread from where we first saw it, as it started to spread, what we would normally see is migratory birds that had died and then cats that were dying from eating the, the dead migratory birds. And, and this would tell you that you probably had avian flu influenza in the area. What about, um, what about the risk to urban chickens? Uh, the risk to urban chickens and, and as well as any chicken po uh, pots are, are really the same, right? So if they were exposed because of a migratory bird in the area that had the virus, they would be able to come down with it. And, and yes, backyard chickens have come down with that and have had to be cold. So thinking about the impact um, about egg availability on vaccine production, it is very heartening to uh, know that um, the food supply, the safety of our food supply is, uh, is, is, is in place, intact, right? Because of the excellent uh, quality control and, and quality assurance measures that are in place. Um, as, as we think about it from a food safety perspective for humans. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of surveillance, right? So there's a lot of surveillance both in, in our food supply, uh, both in farms, whether that be poultry, whether that be cows, um, and to stop the spread before it would ever get into the food supply. Uh, there's certainly surveillance in human populations as well to try to prevent the spread of the virus. But certainly in the food supply, the, the you know, we talked about culling of birds and, and, and to try to stop the spread, but that also means it doesn't get into our food supply. So that, that meat is, is not used. If it's infected poultry, those eggs are not used. They, they stop before it ever gets to the to humans. Certainly, I would advocate that you cook your poultry, that you cook your beef. Uh, and certainly the CDC would certainly recommend right now that you don't drink unpasteurized milk.
right? Um, so that certainly would reduce any risk if something were to somehow slip through, which we don't think it's doing. Mm. So this is a nice segue um, into sort of uh, the research that's uh, happening in your own lab. Um, so can you talk a little bit about some of the newer types of uh, or maybe next generation uh, vaccines that uh, that your lab is working on? Yeah, so biology, as you know, we've been working on a particle-based vac flu vaccine for a number of years now. And um, if you think about the current seasonal flu vaccines, they're largely geared at driving one type of immune response. That's an antibody response. And that antibody response is geared to only one protein in the virus. That's that HA protein that I talked about earlier. Um, when we get infected, though, uh, by natural infection, we mount a very diverse immune response. So we certainly mount antibodies against HA, but we mount antibodies against other flu proteins. And then we have another type of immunity called T cells. Uh, these T cells will find virally infected cells uh, and kill those virally infected cells, thereby limiting the spread of the virus. And our current vaccines are not geared to drive T cell based immunity. And so we've thought for years, if we could get T cell based immunity on top of antibody responses, it would confer greater levels of protection. Uh, the other thing that the vaccines uh, don't do currently is they don't drive mucosal based protection. Uh, and so if you get a shot in the arm, you generate an antibody response and antibody circulates around but you're really not parking cells within the lungs and nasal passages waiting to fight the virus when it shows up. Um, so one of the ideas with this particle-based vaccination is be needle-free, we'd be able to get it in the nasal passages and drive local-based protection, both T and B cell or antibody-based protection, and give levels of higher levels of protection than what's currently seen with the current seasonal flu vaccines. Uh, and that's what we've been able to show in animal models. And as we started out with vaccines against seasonal flu, about a year and a half ago, as you know, we were funded to look at trying to drive a better vaccine against avian flu. At the time, we weren't having the major outbreaks in cattle and others that we've seen here, but it was certainly something that was on the horizon as a possibility. And so we've done uh, developed a vaccine against H5N1, and we've started to test that vaccine in preclinical animal models. Uh, those, that vaccine is showing very good effects of driving both T cell and B cell, or antibody-based immune responses systemic immunity as well as uh, immunity within the nasal and respiratory tree, giving this that local as well as systemic based levels of protection. Uh, and interesting enough, uh, we've now done some trials as to whether that vaccine would confer protection against high path avian flu, but also seasonal, if you will, H5 in one or low path flu. Uh, and the vaccine has performed very, very well. Uh, in fact, right now we've given what would be considered an excessive lethal dose in these animals of a challenge dose, and the vaccine has protected those animals from any type of disease, whether morbidity or mortality. Interestingly enough, uh, we've also tested our H1N1-based vaccine, our seasonal-based vaccine, and that is also providing protection against this high path avian strain. Uh, so this is just having this multifactored immune response uh, both T and antibody and B cell based, but also local and systemic types of protection again for confer greater levels of protection than what seasonal vaccines may. That's very exciting, Kevin. So um, a related question along those lines is, um, while this type of uh, broad based and, and immunity in both, uh, both lungs as well as systemically um, is certainly exciting, exciting to see, um, what can we say about the ability of these novel sort of particle-based vaccines to potentially um, uh, maybe prevent transmission of the disease? So, so how would a vaccinated subject um, be able to stop, um, uh, you know, getting the disease if they're exposed to the virus? Yeah, so we don't have any evidence one way or the other yet, but certainly um, right now having mucosal-based protection would suggest that you would have lower levels of transmission. Right. If you stop the virus where it's replicating and where it, it, it leaves from, uh, then you would be able to prevent transmission. Also, if you had protection, since we're inhaling the virus and you had local based protection, the idea that you would be better protected from transmission would be much higher. Um, but right now we need to still formally test that um, to be able to know for sure. But certainly having systemic protection will give you longer term protection throughout the body, but also having local protection has a real real um, possibility of providing pre prevention, if you will, from transmission. Great. So just to finish this off then, um, having learned about this exciting uh, new approach to, to flu vaccines, both seasonal and avian, um, what do you see as the horizon for this going forward uh, in terms of what it's going to take 
to to get this vaccine, uh, you know, through the approval process? Well, I think several things. One, um, if we're talking specifically about the high path avian influenza based vaccine, there's more testing that needs to be done. Um, if you're talking about the seasonal based vaccine or the particle based vaccination, certainly have tested in several preclinical models that have shown very good efficacy, but also safety. Uh, and I think the next step for that is obviously a phase one clinical trial uh, and getting the approval from the FDA to be able to do that sort of trial. Obviously, this next goal for that would be able to move that into this H5N1 based vaccine technology as well. Uh, but given what we've seen in the preliminary data that with the H1N1 vaccine providing protection in these preclinical pre models, that might confer protection as well against these high pass strains. Well, thank you very much, Kevin, for a very stimulating discussion. Uh, that's uh, it's certainly gratifying to know that, uh, that lots of exciting work is uh, on the way and hopefully uh, we'll be able to uh, even further uh, enhance our preparedness for these types of viruses. So thank you everyone for joining us in this discussion. Um, other episodes this season will explore other facets of respiratory disease in livestock and humans, and later this season, antimicrobial resistance. Please check out the show notes to learn more about the research discussed in this episode. And please be sure to like and subscribe to the NanoVax podcast in your preferred app or media player.